stuff. Done that before. Um, it's good to be here. I, I um, sustainability is um, an evolving uh, topic uh, amongst roasters and amongst the coffee industry. This is something that um, um, I have actually uh, relatively little but intense experience in over the last three years. I'm, to be completely transparent, I'm not a coffee uh, person. I, I've been in coffee for as long as I've worked at World Coffee Research. Uh, that started in 2017. Um, uh, prior to that, I was doing literacy work in Guatemala. And uh, prior to that, uh, domestic violence support in Portland, Oregon, and a number of things. So I've always been in the human development side, and that's always been what um, uh, what has driven my career choices. Um, the thing that got me very fascinated with World Coffee Research is I, I had never seen an opportunity where literally millions of people could be helped if I could get the coffee industry to act in their own self-interest. So it seemed like I, normally you're, you're trying to raise money for domestic violence, or one time I was trying to raise money for um, drug and alcohol treatment for ex-cons uh, in, in Portland. Well, that's a tough sell. Uh, but here, um, really, uh, uh, you all depend on farmers that are happy, healthy, profitable, growing good varieties of coffee that meet your specs, that can fit into your blends, that help you develop products. So, so I had I had actually never seen that kind of opportunity before, and this seems like a one in a lifetime opportunity, and that's why I hopped on. So. So you all know far, far more about cupping, about coffee. Um, you've been to origin far more than me. When I travel, I'm generally going to where coffee is consumed. But what I have done over the last three years is talked with literally hundreds of roasters and coffee green coffee suppliers and allied coffee businesses like La Marzocca and Probot and have understood what their how they're thinking about sustainability. And I have been able to evaluate how they're spending their money on sustainability, how they're prioritizing, and what, what decision process are they going through to make these decisions about what to invest in. So I really wanted this to be something that would be helpful and something that you could take away. And I think this is the question, you know, as a roaster, as a green buyer, a green supplier, what can I do to support sustainability uh, of producers? And um, the first thing I want to say is selling the coffee. Okay, this is probably the most important sustainability activity that you can do buying the coffee and selling the coffee. And where you all are expert at is roasting this coffee, delighting customers, marketing, packaging, creating cafes that people want to return to, creating these exceptional experiences that have your customers getting passionate, enthusiastic about coffee. This is sustainability because there is nothing more important than selling the coffee. And, and so, so that's key. And, um, and, and so continue to focus on that and don't, you know, yes, obviously selling the coffee, there's a self-interest in that for your own profitability and your own businesses. But this is key and this is very important and this is a, a thing that, that you should be focusing the majority of your time, your energy and your thoughts on uh, uh, and, and knowing that in doing that, you are helping producers. So sustainability. what? What is sustainability? This is, many of you I'm sure are aware of this. Here are sort of three different uh, elements of sustainability. Um, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, social sustainability. Um, 
it's important to have these different frameworks. Um, economic sustainability tends to be the foundation. If a farmer goes out of business, if a farmer is literally in poverty, um, all of these other things, environmental sustainability, social sustainability, are, are moot points. They, they, we really can't do much. If the farmer goes out of business, well, the coffee industry loses its ability to impact these two other. And the global coffee, um, the global coffee platform did a survey in 2016 of roasters and, and green coffee suppliers. And by and large, people agree with this. Uh, most respondents uh, uh, share that, that economic sustainability is a prerequisite for prosperity and well-being of producers and environmental conservation. Whereas the profitability uh, is a shared aim, most of the focus varies, though, between these volumes, so yield, production, uh, quality. Uh, this is re related to, you know, very often uh, post-processing, uh, the addition, the experiments with uh, post-processing and fermentation, um, teaching producers how to cup so they can actually evaluate their own quality, uh, price, what's being paid, uh, and, and then cost, what's being charged for the coffee uh, to the consumer. So, focusing in on economic sustainability, there are really two main levers here to pull. And, and as was just mentioned, um, the, the, the price, prices here is getting most of the focus when it comes to economic sustainability. And, and many in the industry really stop there. Like this is the only tool. And very often you're hearing much conversation about the C price. And the C price, there's a problem with the C price. And there's a problem with how we're valuing coffee at origin. And quite frankly, that may be true, that may be not true. Um, I'm not an expert in the C price uh, uh, issue. Um, but one thing I can see is that nothing's changing very quickly. Uh, supply and demand governs every agricultural commodity. Um, and, uh, and farmers are always battling the supply and demand issue everywhere. There's not, there's not a, a farmer in the world that gets to show up at a farmer's market and, and tell the customers coming up to the stand, it cost me $17 to produce this tomato. That was my cost of production. Um, so please pay me $18 for this tomato. That, that's not generally how things work in, in farming and in selling. Yet the industry is sort of trying to fit into that. We're asking producers, what's your cost of production? Uh, we, want, we want them to, uh, we, you know, with the best of intentions, we want to make sure that their cost of production is covered. We want to make sure that there's some profit there. We want to make sure that they can feed their families and we want to make sure that they can make investments and, and pay for the inputs and the fertilizers for their plants so that they have good production year over year. Um, this also comes down to paying more for the green. You hear that a lot, right? And this is absolutely vital, especially during a time of price crisis. Um, it's a little bit like currently we have a patient on the gurney and he or she has a heart attack and, and paying more for the green is kind of like applying CPR. It's going to keep this patient alive until we get to the hospital, perform whatever operations we need so that they can be happy and healthy and go forward. But as a long-term sustainability strategy, probably not. And, and why is that? And this is a, one of my favorite quotes, uh, quotes from Dr. Montagnon, uh, WCR scientific director. It is not enough that coffee farming becomes more profitable. It has to be more profitable than any other possible use for the land. 
right? There's only one reason a farmer should grow coffee because that is how they can extract the most value from that land. If, if, if that farmer can make more money growing beans or maize or corn or what, or, or selling it to development like what's happening in Costa Rica very much, um, that's what that farmer should do. So trying to maintain, just trying to pay more for the green in the long term is not a long-term viability strategy. So, um, so what does that leave? That leaves farming efficiencies. And this is, this is how farmers make money. They grow, they grow their crops more effectively, more efficiently. Um, good agricultural practices, post-harvest processing, traceability that can reward producers for quality. These are all these are all ways that we can begin to contribute to economic sustainability. You know, focusing in on uh, good agricultural practices. So, good agricultural practices. You hear this a lot. Gap, they're called, and. You know, this is a, these are some coffee trees in Ethiopia, um, not very productive coffee trees. Um, you know, rejuvenation, pruning, you know, not happening, composting, shade management. This is, these are trees that are just left to, to grow and the yields are very low. But with some good agricultural practices, some rejuvenation, some pruning, um, you can see uh, this is this this here. This tree uh, is is uh, the result of some stumping that came back. So rejuvenation in Ethiopia. Uh, you can dramatically increase yields, and increasing yields is is absolutely key. Um, so. This is a key strategy that the industry is using a lot now. You may have heard of organizations like TechnoServe, but providing producers technical expertise, this is something that, that exporters do, that importers do. They make investments in their own supply chains to help producers grow their coffee more efficiently and more effectively. And, and it's a good thing. Here are some of the yields um, that we're seeing per hectare yields. And you can see um, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya. These are, this data is coming uh, actually from a, a group that you should all know about, Inveritas. Um, Google that. Um, they're uh, an amazing new um, organization that's kind of taking certifications, but flipping them upside down in a very interesting way using statistical analysis rather than sort of a one-time um, uh, uh, certification process. But, uh, um, you know, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Peru, these yields of uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, and then you see over here Brazil kind of knocking it out of the park uh, with Arabica at 1.7. Um, and it's important to realize that these are averages. So, you know, in Tanzania, where you're seeing 0 0.3, you're going to have some that are much higher, but you're going to have many that are much lower than, uh, uh, you know, 300 kilograms per hectare. So you can imagine um, double the yields. Here's, here's a couple of happy coffee farmers in, in Ethiopia that after rejuvenation of their trees, doubled the yields and had immediate impact, immediate financial impact. Um, so, so this is definitely very important and key. And this is what we have today. This is one of the main tools we have today to actually improve yields and, and improve the economic sustainability of producers. This also obviously impacts quality. Um, La Roya comes into a field, even if you're harvesting coffee from that particular field, we've done quite a bit of research on this, that several aromas, several taste factors really begin to be impacted. Even if you're getting good amounts of cherry out of that field, just having Leroya in the field begins to diminish the quality. Okay, now here's the downside. Farmer training programs are expensive. 
and not within reach of many medium and small roasters, right? Back to the question, what can I do as a roaster? And very often you being able to coordinate uh, a significant farmer training program is, is not gonna happen. Um, the vast majority of the money being spent in uh, sustainability right now are these kinds of programs. Um, WCR right now is involved in this project uh, called the MOCA project. It's $37 million to, to do farmer training. So these are big capital intensive. You're talking about working with thousands of farmers in different languages and farmers that have varying levels of literacy. This is complex and difficult work and it's expensive. And the problems that are faced by smallholders around the world are many. And, and good agricultural practices alone are not going to uh, get us where we need to be. Here's some of the issues that we're talking about. Um, underfunded and uncoordinated research and development. I know a lot about that because that's the sector that we're in. Um, lack of access to finance, lack of access to affordable and reliable planting material. Um, R&R uh, um, best practices, uh, rehabilitation and, and, and uh, renovation best practices, actually all best practices. Um, low value trading models that don't reward quality. And, and this is really the area where really for the first time um, uh, roasters can begin to have an impact. This is, you've heard, you've heard about this, these slides in this study that, that World Coffee Research did along with SEAT. You've maybe heard uh, that uh, by 2050, uh, half the suitable coffee lands go away using very conservative climate models. And, um, uh, and, and yet we're gonna need twice as much coffee if you just use a very conservative 3% growth rate on consumption. And that is a conservative rate. So this is important to know. The, the, one of the key things here is that down here you'll see these different, these different colors uh, represent different climate types. Because as the climate changes, it's not going to change the same everywhere. Um, the purple area, for instance, that's, that's typically higher elevations and where you find very constant temperatures. That's some of the most ideal places to grow coffee. You can see here, this is tracking with the Andes Mountains. These are tracking over here with the mountainous areas in, in Uganda, Kenya. Uh, the, 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 the salmon color, that's your hot, dry area those areas are going to be particularly impacted. So let me toggle here. This is how we are today. And then here's how we estimate it's going to look in 2050. So kind of going back and forth there. You can see that we lose a lot of suitable coffee land. Now there's two things about this that you have to understand. One is that we're talking about suitable coffee land and not coffee land under production. So there is an abundance of, we're not gonna run out of land to plant coffee. There will be enough land to plant coffee. There's no question about that. But there's two things that happen. One is we took data points of also currently uh, cultivated coffee. And what we see when we do that is we lose about 30% of currently suitable coffee land become unsuitable in 2050. So that's a significant disruption to supply chains, to coffee growing communities, to farmers around the world. And good agricultural practices as they are currently taught are primarily the basics. And, and I am not kidding you when I'll tell you that most of them are coming out of 1960s agronomy books. You know, when we're talking about fertilizing and pruning and mulching, and if a producer is not using these techniques, 
without a question, they can improve their yields immediately and their quality immediately. So these are the basics. But these basics are not going to help the producer meet the challenges that are at hand. And these basics are not enough to do things like double yields and, um, and, and sometimes even triple yields and improve quality. So here's, well, I've got a little formatting issue here. Here's the, the other issue that we're talking about is, you know, what we're trying to save, it's not like, again, it's not like coffee is going to disappear. We all love coffee. We all drink coffee. We're going to do, we're going to go to the ends of the earth to make sure that we have the coffee that we need. There's no, there's no threat to coffee, but where there is a threat, there's a threat to origins. There's a threat to where we buy coffee. And if you're concerned about having a wide variety of origins where you can source your coffee with a wide variety of flavor profiles to make your blends, this is, this is, is what's at stake here. Um, uh, you can see uh, some areas of permanent decline, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Kenya, these are uh, 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 progressively declining production rates. Um, challenging areas in Ethiopia, India, Mexico, Tanzania. Uh, we really see sort of a, a pretty flat growth rate there. We're calling uh, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua safe. You know, I don't know how safe they are, um, but comparatively speaking, they're pretty safe. Um, and then some areas of high potential for growth, some things that we're beginning to see where production is, is rising pretty quickly. But again, even in Peru, we, if we go back to this slide, um, you know, the yields in Peru, uh, a little bit better than a, a half metric ton per hectare. It's hard to make a living if that's all the coffee you're growing. There's just no question about it. So, again, the question, what can we do? And um, what you can do, and this is a concept really that, that, I'm, that I'm coming up with after talking with so many people that are doing sustainability, that have sustainability in their titles at, 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 at all of your organizations, anybody who's working on this issue. And it's this concept uh, where you talk about a balanced portfolio of sustainability activity. And it's a balance between competitive efforts and pre-competitive efforts. And I'm gonna explain what that means. And it's a balance between certifications, farmer training, and agronomic R&D. These are the main tools that we all are using right now to try to improve the economic sustainability of farmers. Now, um, pre-competitive, what, what is that? What is pre-competitive? Pre-competitive are strategies that are typically, def one of the, 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 uh, the attributes of pre-competitive uh, activities is that they're very often very scalable. So they can, they can happen over wide ranges, over entire regions. Um, they're systemic in nature. So they're really getting to the root. They're very upstream, can be necessary preconditions for success. However, the results and impacts are often delayed. Um, and the results and impacts are shared. And what I mean by that is no single entity can say, you know, we did this because no single entity did it. Pre-competitively means we've all come together and worked together for a very specific uh, end goal. And there are certain problems that can only be addressed pre-competitively uh, because they're just too big. Individual impact activities are often, they're competitive. Uh, uh, in, impacts uh, um, uh, very specific individual producers or very specific groups of producers. Um, they're difficult or impossible to scale, okay? And, and like farmer training is one of those things. Um, and Veritas has recently calculated that there are 12.5 million farms. Um, so that, you know, the number of farmers is, is, is gonna be a bit higher than that. And uh, to train 50,000, farmers is an enormous undertaking. So very difficult to scale. Um, but 
the results and impacts are often attained in a shorter time frame, and the results and impacts very often can be owned. You know, a, a, a coffee company can say, you know, put their arm around the, 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 the producer and, and, and take the photo and, you know, we did this, we helped this, we, we paid more for the coffee, we provided technical expertise for this particular piece. And I want to say that there's, there's, both are absolutely necessary. Um, one, one of these two is, um, I, I use this term competitive effort. Competitive efforts are those sustainability efforts that are going to also benefit the benefit, the, uh, the person who's paying for it. So if you're buying coffee, if you're like Nordic Approach and you're buying coffee, you have an interest that your supply chain, that your producers are have the technical expertise to produce good quality at a good price year over year. And so making investments in your own supply chain, in your own producers, makes complete sense. And it's good. It's a good thing to do. It's a win-win. It's sustainable because you're putting money in and you're going to get that money later. It's an investment. This is great. Um, but the problem with this is that it doesn't get us to sustainability. And this is, this is one of the... Uh, uh, really important pieces here that I'm finding um, people don't quite grasp yet. And this is that um, because farmers are interdependent, you can't have an island of sustainability in a desert of unsustainable farming. And so coming in and just making sure that you're paying enough for the green, that your supply chain is sustainable, is not enough to achieve sustainability for even that producer. Because supply chains require volume. And if you have, if you have one coffee farmer in a region that's doing it right, and is, and is getting rewarded for their quality and is making enough money, but the majority of the farmers in the region are sort of migrating out of coffee. What happens is, you know, these dry mills, these wet mills, they all need a certain amount of volume to continue to do business. Um, if, if there's less farmers in your region, your cost of inputs are gonna go up. Your cost of shipping, of getting your product to the market is going to go up. The number of buyers that are coming to your region to look at coffee goes down. So you really have to have this balanced portfolio where you're not only doing these individual supply chain competitive activities, but you're also including some kind of regional, scalable, pre-competitive activities as well in order to raise the tide and float all the boats higher, even those boats that are not in your supply chain. Here's some examples to sort of uh, illustrate this a little bit, pre-competitive kind of activities being um, in red. Uh, so uh, over here in the environmental sustainability, uh, agroforestry, that can actually be kind of both, that's what I've got there. Pesticide reduction strategies, fungicide reduction strategies. So the research that goes into actually um, understanding how, uh, how to use fungicides better or whether you even need to use fungicides at all um, can be something that helps an entire region. And that information can be distributed quickly and it can be scaled very quickly as well. For instance, WCR has recently done some research where we saw that coffee grown between a certain altitude, that um, good plant husbandry, strong, healthy plants, were, was just as effective at fighting Laroya as fungicides. Now that's, a, that's 
that's enormous that's enormously important information if you're a farmer that you can actually having your plants be you can then spend money on things like fertilizers and things that are going to actually help your yield and not be going out there with the additional cost of labor and expense of spraying fungicides which don't do anything for the quality of the coffee um, and, uh, uh, and, and over long term have questionable effects on the, uh, um, on the water supplies in the environment, on pollinators in the area. There's a lot of long term effects for this. So, so, so that would be an example of a pre-competitive piece. Improved variety, again, that's another pre-competitive uh, activity. You develop a new variety like Central Americano, uh, an F1 variety, that then can be distributed to, in, to entire regions. Farmers have that at, uh, available for them. Things like nursery development. Oh man, let me tell you, the, the seed sector in coffee is practically non-existent. And you know, the idea that, you know, this, uh, the romantic idea that coffee farmers should, you know, that they're growing their own coffee and have their own nurseries, um, this is actually quite a disaster for the industry. Uh, WCR has been doing a lot of testing on this, and uh, we offer a service, for instance, to coffee producers where we will identify the variety of coffee you're growing through a DNA fingerprint. So we have people sending us their coffee leaves and saying, you know, what is this? On the form, we ask the producer, what coffee do you think this is? And how often do you think they're right? Now, this isn't statistically, uh, you know, you gotta remember that people that are sending us their leaves have some question about the variety, but how often do you think the farmer knows what variety they're growing? Fifty. Fifty. Half the time they're right, half the time they're wrong. And and this is because, you know, they've got the coffee from somebody who they said, yes, this is Kachawai, or yes, this is Bourbon, and, and, and they got it from somebody, and they got it from somebody, and when we finally do the DNA analysis, you know, we come back and we say, well, you know, this is Bourbon-ish. <laughs> You know, we can see the genetics of Bourbon in there, but there was some hanky-panky going on here with some other varieties. This, you know, so this coffee is never going to perform like Bourbon. This farmer is going to plant this. They're going to plant it in ideal conditions, and they're never going to receive the quality that Bourbon can deliver in those ideal conditions. This is devastating. Okay, this is this is. So again. Uh, Things that are uh, individual supply chain, coming in with business support, value added addition at, at origin, uh, uh, farmer training, gap, things like this. So, um, you know, the wheel of declining profits here, um, underfunded and uncoordinated R&D. A lot of R&D happening, um, uh, but, but much of it uncoordinated. And, and really, when you take a look at the 360 or $400 million a year that's being spent by you all on sustainability activities, um, a lot of that going into certi uh, certifications, uh, but also into good agricultural practices and, and, and these kinds of things, um, uh, really not delivering, not moving the needle yet. So. So then what happened here is that many in the coffee industry realized this and they came together to create World Coffee Research. So this isn't an organization that was created by a bunch of scientists who thought this is what you all need. This is what you all created because you said you needed it. And, and really, this is the first um, the first effort of this, of its kind, historically. And, um, and it's also the first opportunity that roasters and that some coffee suppliers have ever had to invest in this upstream pre-competitive research. It's never been available before. You've had 
you know, we've had, we talk about sustainability and, and you look at the trajectory of sustainability over the last 10 years, you know, first it was certifications. And this was, we have, you know, we have sustainably sourced coffee because we have these certifications. As we began to become more sophisticated, travel down to origin, learn more, we began to see the limitations of certifications. Certifications play uh, a, a reasonably good role in the overall picture, but we also understand that they have significant limitations. So let's take a look at some interesting things here, and I'm gonna talk to you briefly about some of the activities WCR is doing. So, lack of access to finance. How does research and development affect that? This is, uh, we have the largest multi-location varieties trials happening that have ever been happened, historically large, that when this uh, network of, of test trials are in, it will be 1,100 uh, trials happening in 27 different countries, um, each trial testing, uh, each trial testing uh, uh, two improved varieties and two improved agronomic approaches using the farmer's existing agronomic protocols and existing variety as the control. This here's the network. Here's how these trials are going to go out. I'm going to tell you that by 2022, we're, we're not going to make it at the rate we're currently going. I'm thinking maybe 2023. That's what it looks like to me today. Here's the general layout here. I was describing this. So this, this up and down right here would be the producer's existing varieties. Let's say it's Bourbon. And then across this way, this is the, the, the producer's existing uh, uh, agronomic protocols. And, and for simplicity's sake, let's say that existing agronomic protocol is that this is a passive organic farmer. In other words, the cherries get red, they pick them. <laughs> they don't do anything. And then what we do is we bring in an improved variety. And over here, this is an improved variety using passive organic. This is improved variety two using passive organic. So you can see what will happen if I just plant a new variety and I don't change anything else. What happens to my yields? What happens to my quality? What happens to my profitability? Over here, you've got an agronomic approach. Agronomic approach, what is that? That's gonna be four different things. That's gonna be things like shade. It's gonna be things like plant spacing. It's gonna be things like fertilization, and it's gonna be things like soil preservation. So various strategies, and also intercropping. This is another huge piece that we're doing. Um, you, you know, uh, which crops grow best with which varieties? Which crops can actually provide some temporal shade and help to cool the soil, but also provide a secondary income. These are all things that right now, what are farmers doing? They're just trying stuff. Okay, this is what's happening at Origin. Farmers are just out there trying stuff. And let me tell you, that's expensive. And, and it's inconclusive at best. Very often, you, you, you might have a farmer who tries a new agronomic approach and it it, they get better yield, and they think, ah, I've discovered this, you know, but then next year, whatever, the rains are too early or they're too late or something else changes in the variables, and suddenly that thing that they thought they hit upon is not really working so well for them. So this is tremendously high risk and very expensive for producers, yet producers are doing it. Producers are doing it. So what does this result in? Oh, here's one of those plots. So this is a huge amount of data coming in. We've never had this kind of data. And what producers or anyone in the industries will be able to do is filter their data by, they'll be able to say, okay, what's my farm size? What's my farming system? What's the elevation of my farm? Latitude, longitude, and we bring down weather and disease threats in the area. Soil type, shade percentage, market that I serve. You know, if I serve the commercial market, I'm gonna grow one kind of coffee if I serve Top specialty, I'm gonna grow in another kind. Many other variables. And what this data is going to be able to provide these producers is scientifically based recommendations for varietal selection and agronomic treatments like shade, plant spacing, fertilization, 
all to project and maximize profit. So what is this? This is an ROI calculator for renovation and improved agronomy. You're thinking about changing your, your fertilization regimen? Well, instead of just trying something different and seeing how it goes, you can actually plug in the numbers and figure out what is going to happen to my crop? What is my ROI going to be? And when you know ROI, now you can go to the bank. Now you can begin to say, hey, here's some statistically significant data that says, if I use this variety and this agronomic treatment, this is going to be my financial result at the end. This kind of data and this kind of information does not exist. Not broadly, not for the entire world, not for the span of all the different varieties that are out there. And this is the kind of work that can only be done pre-competitively, and this is the kind of work that the Global Coffee Monitoring Program is after. International multi-location variety trials. Boy, this is some low-hanging fruit here. Um, so, what grows well where? That's what this is about. What varieties grow well where? You know, it's, it's amazing that we know, uh, say, Pinot Noir grows very well in Burgundy. And the farmers in Burgundy make a very nice living growing Pinot Noir in Burgundy. Now, if, if the wine industry was like the coffee industry, we would be going to uh, somebody who was interested in, gr in, in, in making wine, and we would say, Yo, okay, you, you want to grow wine. Okay, you want to be a vintner. Well, here are grapes. Okay, here are grapes. Um, you grow these grapes, and let's say the variety happens to be Pinot Noir. You grow these grapes, and, uh, and you can make wine. And so the farmer in Tuscany, with the hot, dry climate, takes the Pinot Noir grapes, puts them in the ground, and they cannot get a decent bottle of wine, and, and their, their fruit turns to raisin, and you know they've got all kinds of issues. Now, what happens? Oh, well, you're kind of using the, the coffee as a kind of a, an analogy. What would happen is, well, the farmers in Burgundy would be hired as consultants to come down to help the farmers in Italy. Because that's, right, we're, we, we're obviously, we're doing it right, we've got the knowledge, and, and we're gonna tell you how to grow your grapes better. When actually the problem is, is that the varietal that is being used in, is not adapted well for the conditions. And we know this about wine, but in coffee, 80% of the coffee that's in the ground is pretty much identically identical to one another. It's Bourbon or Tipica, or it's a brother or sister of Bourbon or Tipica, or sometimes maybe a kissing cousin of Bourbon and Tipica, okay? So there's not a lot of genetic diversity in coffee, and yet we have coffee, we're giving coffee farmers this, this same variety of coffee all over the world, whether they're in hot and dry or constant or cool and wet, and we're expecting that they're all going to have similar results. Well, this isn't going to happen. Being able to, being able to match the genetic, uh, uh, the genetic with the environment is absolutely key. And that's what the International Multi-Location Variety Trial is. This is what we did. We went around to all these countries and we asked them for their best performers. Give us your best performers, best in class. Then we turned around and we returned this entire collection to each one of the donor countries. And that way you could test your best performers against the world's best performers. This is the first time this has ever happened. So what's going to happen is these national coffee institutes around the world are gonna be able to see how do these other currently available varieties match up to our own best performers. And this is going to help spread quickly uh, the, uh, uh, the adoption of, of, of new varieties that may be uh, more in, um, uh, adapted to the environments uh, that they're in. This is, uh, this is the end of 2018. Uh, I, I need to get an updated slide here, but this is some of the first vegetative growth data coming in off of the International Multilocation Variety Trial. Um, um, one of the interesting things here is, um, is actually related to our breeding program, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. 